Welcome to the Australia Institute's Economics Academy. I'm the Institute's Chief Economist, Richard Dennis. And I'm the Senior Economist, Matt Burden. And in this episode, we're going to talk about when markets work well. You've all heard people talk about market forces and the efficiency of markets and maybe even something about perfect competition. In this episode, we're going to talk about when markets do a pretty good job of allocating scarce resources for us. And in another episode, we'll talk about when they do a bad job. So Matt, what makes for a good market? Consumers are getting the best deal. You know, we say you shouldn't pick winners, but in economics, we do actually try and pick winners. And um, we should be trying to pick the consumer, that is the, the person buying it. And in fact, if you take a close look at economics, when it thinks it's working well is actually when the producer is having to work flat, very, very hard um, in order to get customers at a low, low price. So once upon a time, we used to talk about the idea of consumer sovereignty, that the consumer is king. The whole point of economics, as Matt said, is supposed to be about making consumers happy. Producers aren't supposed to be happy. Producers are supposed to get just enough price to cover their cost of production so that we can have all of the stuff we want. So in a well-functioning market, and we'll talk about that in a minute, in a well-functioning market, consumers are supposed to be happy with the choices they're getting, the prices they're paying, and producers are supposed to be getting just enough price, just enough price to cover their costs and to cover their, the cost of their time and their effort and their risk, and nothing more. In fact, in economics, in, in economists, what we call perfect competition, Matt, how much profit should a firm be making in, in a perfectly competitive market? When the market is working, humming along nicely, how much profit should they be making? Well, virtually none. No, I've got to interrupt you there, Matt. The whole point of modern capitalism is for companies to make billions of dollars. I mean, billionaires are what makes the economy strong. I'm confused. Well, billionaires is actually a sign of market failure. Oh, and you're messing talk- with my head. Billionaires are proof of success of capitalism. Of, of exploiting markets, absolutely, that don't work. But in a perfectly competitive market, in a market that economists think is the best kind of market, then firms are tiny, they're really small, they're insignificant, they're only just covering their costs plus their, um, their time and effort, um, and no more. And if any of them ever did make a larger profit, New firms would flood into the market and eat away that profit. Wow. It's like everything I read in the newspapers is completely crap. Absolutely. Right. So just to be clear, pretty much everything you read in the newspapers is completely crap. In in economics, we talk about this concept of the efficient allocation of scarce resources. And as Matt said, when a market is efficiently allocating scarce resources, the people making stuff, whether it's a pen or Matt's shoes or software, when a market is operating efficiently, when a market is, in fact, we call it perfectly competitive, what happens is that if any firm ever tries to charge us a lot more to make something, a pen, a shoe, or an app, if anyone ever tries to charge us too much for something, the profit that they make is a powerful signal for other people to come flooding into the market. And when other people flood in, the supply increases, the price comes down, and the profit vanishes. That happens all the time, doesn't it, Matt? It's really, really difficult to think of a market that's perfectly competitive. There are no, some I've read lots of economics textbooks. There are lots of examples. Um, no. No. <laughs> there are some that kind of get close but still fail. So, for example, in Australia, selling coffee at coffee shops, right? There are lots and lots of coffee shops. You can pick and choose there uh, and um, as a general rule the price is quite low and I would suggest that the the profit in the uh, coffee shop industry is not massive. All right so let's get some rules here so if we're going to have an efficient market a market that works well we're going to have lots of sellers. Yep and buyers and and what's the point of having why is it so good to have lots of buyers and lots of sellers? Well because if there's lots of sellers and buyers then um, there's lots of competition. So if I don't like that particular coffee shop, I can go to the coffee shop two doors down um, that sells a better cup of coffee that's cheaper. Right, but coffee costs five bucks in Australia. Are you telling me it costs five bucks for the beans and the milk? No, absolutely not. So I'm not saying that it is perfectly competitive, 
Um, but lots of buyers and sellers basically increases the amount of competition and it forces um, firms to try and give you the best cup of coffee that they can at the lowest price. And if I try and charge seven bucks, people will go next door and pay five yep. for you. Okay, so lots of buyers, lots of sellers. In perfect competition, what else do we need? Well, as you said before, we need what economists call no barriers to entry. Now, no barriers to entry just means that it doesn't cost you anything to enter the market and set up. So if you think about an airline industry, if you wanted to set up your own airline, that's a really expensive thing to do. So there are lots of barriers to entry to get into the airline industry. So a barrier to entry is something that stops me entering a market to compete with you mm -hmm. in selling the stuff. Yep, so when there are no barriers to entry, if you tried to put your price up and you succeeded because there weren't enough, say, um, sellers in that particular market, lots of other people would go, wow, there's good profit in that. And because it doesn't cost them anything to get in the market, they'd all set up next door to you and lower the price and cut away your profit. Okay, so when, when there's lots of sellers, lots of buyers, no barriers to entry, markets are gonna do a pretty good job. So oh, there's to... more. Oh, okay, what else? There's also perfect information. Oh, okay, what's that mean? Perfect information basically means that you immediately, instantly, and at no cost, know all the prices of all the firms, including the quality, and you can make a rational choice on what you want. So if I wanna get a new phone plan, I just know which was the cheap one. Exactly right, and what you need, and, and all of that garbled, long form stuff, you immediately understand, um, and, and all the different uh, pricing, the way they price it, you immediately understand it all. This sounds like crazy talk. It is crazy talk. All right, are they the only criteria that make for a well-functioning market? No, we've got another one, externalities. Now externalities is another great economic term, um, and basically what it means is, is that there are no costs that aren't associated with the buyer and the seller. So a really good example of this is climate change, right? If you go out and you buy your electricity from a coal-fired power station, all right, there are costs that um, are associated with the, the, the sale of that um, um, coal-fired power that aren't captured by just me and the coal-fired power station. That is, future generations are going to be impacted by it. So I might produce something uh, like electricity from burning coal, and I've got to pay for building the power station, I've got to pay for the coal, but I get free waste disposal. Yeah. And, and, and when I dispose of my waste, I'm imposing pollution costs on someone else. So if I'm not paying for those external costs, that's a kind of subsidy, isn't it? Yeah, exactly right. So the, the market price will actually be lower because of the externality, because the firm is not paying for the price of that disposal. Right, so if I was growing rice in Australia and someone gave me free water from the Murray, uh, would that be a subsidy? Yeah, absolutely right. And what it would probably mean is you buy, you, you grow more rice than you would otherwise do in a perfectly competitive market. But I hear farmers complain about the price of water all the time. Well, what they're actually complaining about is the fact that there is a limited amount of water. Um, and that, well, shouldn't uh, the government just give them more water? Shouldn't they legislate some more water? They could if um, water wasn't a scarce resource. But as we're discovering in the Murray-Darling um, Basin is um, water is a scarce resource. So when we've got a scarce resource like water or a scarce resource like the atmosphere, if we give it to someone for free, we're using it up and the people that are using it up are going to uh, be able to produce stuff cheaper than they otherwise should and more and produce more stuff than they otherwise would. Right, okay, so we've got some rules. Markets work well when there's lots of sellers, lots of buyers, no barriers to entry, perfect information, and no externalities. So let's do a little pop quiz here, Matt. Um, I've heard of this plucky little company called Apple. Mm -hmm. um, are there any barriers to entry that stop me competing with them? I think they've got very good IP lawyers, so that might be a... What's uh, IP? Um, intellectual property. So if I set up a phone that looks almost identical to an Apple phone, I'll probably get a cease and desist letter um, and they'll tell me that I'm infringing on their copyright, which is a barrier to entry. So you mean that whenever there's patents or copyright, we can't assume that markets will work well? No, because in fact, they're, they're a barrier to entry. They stop new firms from coming in and competing with Apple and pushing the the price of Apple products like iPhones down. So even though they make 
more money than any other company in the world, it might not be a well-functioning market. Well, the fact that they make more money than any company in the world is probably a sign that they don't um, work in a well-functioning market. There are not lots of sellers. Okay. There are big barriers to entry. There isn't perfect uh, information. So what about coal-fired uh, coal power stations? Um, are there any barriers to entry? Well, yeah, setting up a coal-fired power station is pretty expensive, I imagine. Um, you've got to get the land, you've got to get the approval. People probably don't want a coal-fired power station built in their area, so there's going to be a lot of resistance to that. What about externalities? There's huge externalities, and that's their biggest problem, is essentially to make coal-fired power viable, um, you have to assume that they're allowed to dump their waste product into the air for free. If they were forced to pay for dumping their waste product in the air, um, from the size of the externality, then they would become unviable. Are you making all of this up or is this like written in every economics textbook ever? There is a chapter called Perfect Competition in every economics um, textbook and it will all be there. All right, so what about banks? Uh, are, are banks an example of where markets work well? Well, banks make enormous profits. Some of the most- So they must be good. Yes, well, that's the argument the banks give. You can't regulate us. It's good that we're large. It's good that we make huge profits because we're stable. We're, we're, we're not gonna collapse anytime soon. So the richer they are, the more not like perfect competition they are, that's but right. the better they are. Yes, that's what they argue. So basically there are only a few banks. It's hard to set up. Can here. I set up a bank? No, Why you not? can't. You need a license from the government to set up a bank and they're not gonna give it to you. But them. governments love competition and competition policy and tell me markets work all the time. So why can't I have a bank license? Well, governments decide those kinds of things and it might be based on, on how much lobbying, it might be based on how um, wealthy the current banks are. Well, let's stick with banks for a minute because perfect information suggests that rational consumers make rational decisions in choosing their banks. Now, I know no one watching this would ever do this, but I've heard there are people that have mortgages with the big banks in Australia where they pay interest rates that are far higher than the interest rates offered by smaller banks. In fact, ah. most people have a mortgage with one of the big four banks. No, that can't be, Matt, because we know that there's an elasticity of demand. We know there's a downward sloping demand curve. We know that in perfect, there's perfect information. Why would anyone bank with the big four banks when the banks, the big four banks nearly always charge higher interest rates than well, everyone else. Because the big four banks are stable and safe, Richard. And the last thing you want to do is borrow money from a bank for them to get broke and you not have to pay it back. Because if I borrowed money from the bank because they were safe and they went broke, that would hurt me how? Well, then you wouldn't be able to pay the mortgage back. So I'd get a free house? Yes. So I really don't want my bank to go broke? No. I think I do. <laughs> I'm confused. So markets work well for industries that aren't like banking, aren't like tech, and aren't like mining. Yeah, most firms, in fact, if you look across all the industries in Australia, the vast majority of them look nothing like perfect competition. They, they don't come anywhere close to filling these, um, um, these criteria. In fact, most of them are what we call oligopolies. There are a few large firms with big barriers to entry, imperfect competition, competition, they often have externalities and they use their market power to extract bigger profits. All right, well, let's try some yes or no questions. If there's externalities like pollution, do markets work well without regulation? No. If there's barriers to entry like licensing or intellectual property, do markets work well without regulation? No. If there aren't lots of sellers in the market, does the market work well without regulation? No. So when do markets work well without regulation? Never. Right. Okay. So, can markets work well, Matt? They can in um, the hypothetical world that the economics creates called perfect competition. Outside of that hypothetical imaginary world, no, they can't. That's right. So, next time someone tells you we have to leave it to the market, next time someone tells you that market forces will fix it, next time someone tells you the more profit a company earns, the, the, the more effective and efficient the market must be, you've just heard someone who fits into one of two categories. Someone that's never read an economics textbook in their life or someone who's lying to you. It's not complicated. Markets are really good at getting pens made. They're really good at getting coffee made. And you know, markets do all sorts of things pretty well, but they're not perfect. And they very, very rarely conform to the assumptions which you could tell yourself mean that you don't need a lot of regulation 
to get good outcomes. Nearly everything you buy comes from an industry which does not fit the criteria for this. It's not the end of the world, but it means that we have to have careful conversations about designing regulation and designing consumer protections and designing cultural norms to allow people to get some good out of these companies. They've got a very strong incentive to make a profit. That's fine. Competition is supposed to drive the profit and prices down. But if they can create lots of barriers to entry, if they can get free stuff from us, if they can rely on the fact that we're confused, then they get higher profits, we get more expensive stuff, and we cause things like climate change. So markets can do some things well sometimes, but the idea that if we leave everything to the market, everything will be efficiently allocated, well, that's an idea that's not actually found in any economics textbook. We do these things for free because we really love helping people understand economics. But if you can like, share or subscribe to our service, that'd be great.